All right. So moving off of the geopolitical situation behind Tacitus as Agricola, let's talk now about Roman administration in Britain, what this looks like day to day. This is a map of the marching forts and military emplacements in Britain. The marching camps are the remains of camps laid down for temporary use by Romans moving outside of Roman territory to perhaps scout and conquer new territory. And you'll see them concentrated here in the north along Hadrian's Wall and up into Scotland. So this is territory that Rome didn't hold as closely or as permanently, but which Rome felt the need to control to keep folks living in these areas from raiding south of the border. But this is not just about a giant wall to keep the wildlings out, um, Pake Game of Thrones, this isn't that kind of situation. Rather, this is about controlling borders in order to mediate and tax trade and also to um, keep your garrisons in line and connected. But if you look at the roads and fort situations in the south, you have quite a lot of permanent and semi-permanent forts connected by many, many Roman proved roads. Britain is effectively networked and riddled with these things. This is an unusual amount of military activity and permanent fort emplacements. And this is partly because Britain was always a tenuously held border territory, but also because Britain was a reservoir of troops for the defense of Atlantic territory in the Roman Empire. So Britain sits along the coast of northern France, Troops can be sent by boat south to Spain. They can be sent um, eastward into the Baltic, the North Sea, and into the rivers of Germania, including the Rhine, which is an active border zone where Rome is continually needing troops and patrols. So by putting all of your troops in Britain and not, say, exclusively along the border forts of the Rhine and the Danube, you're creating a reservoir of troops that Germans can't conveniently raid. So this means that all of the island of Britain is a garrison, but it's also a breadbasket. So Rome is using Britain as a way to feed all of these troops, not just in the island, but also along the walls in Germania, along the Rhine. Um, some of this is supplied by farmlands in Gaul, of course, but the sheer amount of military activity requires the requisition of a huge amount of food. So Britain is doing that, but it's also a mining territory. So they're mining silver, lead, tin, especially tin. Britain is a wealthy source of tin and you need tin to make bronze. And bronze is still really, really important because it doesn't corrode as much as iron, although you can mine iron too. No, not as much though. You're going to the Alps for that more. So Britain is literally and figuratively a gold, well, really a silver mine, but a mine. Lots of very nice mineral deposits. So it's a good chunk of land to get a hold of, and Rome sits on it. Um, the conquest map with the naval supply routes is here next to the two walls we're going to look at next. So under the Emperor Hadrian, he's the last emperor on our timeline on that uh, timeline slide in the last lecture, Hadrian's wall was built as a forward base. So this wall, again, not a wall to keep the barbarians out. This is rather a wall to serve as a way to concentrate your troops in a way that doesn't stress the land out too much. So there are a number of forts and garrisons stationed along the walls so that you can keep a lot of troops there but still move food and material and supplies along the wall very quickly so everybody eats but not everybody's in the same place on the wall. The wall also has checkpoints so that trade can come and go through this area but you can also monitor it for activity but, and this is the other thing that people don't necessarily think of when they think of Hadrian's Wall because it's been downplayed in documentaries and such, 
This is a base where supplies and material can be sent northwards to Romans who are going north of the wall in order to secure more territory and to create alliances with allied states and kingdoms. Now, eventually there's a second wall, the Antonine Wall built here. So this is by uh, Hadrian's successor, Antoninus Pius. So Hadrian's Wall is built first, number one, number two, Antonine Wall. So let's look at them. This is Hadrian's Wall today. Parts of Hadrian's Wall are built with stone, other parts with earthenworks. And stone is not necessarily better or worse than earthen works. It just depends on what's easy, easier to get in the area and more dur durable. And well, you can see the durability here. Parts of Hadrian's Wall have lasted really well, despite locals pulling stones out of it to use it to build you know, cities. Uh, this has not been an active military fortification for 2000 years, but bits of it are still in pretty decent shape. I've chosen this bit of wall in order to showcase the porous nature of this wall. It would have been another story high back in the day. So this is a high-ish wall, but we're not talking about like a 20 story tall wall that you need an elevator to get to the top to. This is high enough to watch out from. You can stop a small raiding party, but a determined army will be able to batter their way through and get through. So this is meant to be a deterrent to border slippage. But at regular intervals along the wall, there are these kinds of forts. You can see here there's a gate at the front and the back. This is in order to let people through. And there are these buildings on the side that serve as checkpoints, customs points, areas where you can extract taxes to check for shenanigans and to control the flow so that you can make sure that people coming in and going out are okay. Essentially, we got a border checkpoint. Border checkpoints still kind of look like this, just more trucks. So the point of Hadrian's Wall is not to stop people coming through, it's to make the right people able to come through at a, uh, a useful pace. But then also, you don't just need these buildings for customs. Also, you need them to store stuff so that you can send stuff along the wall. If somebody gets raided, you can go and rebuild that area that's been raided. You can keep extra food in case somebody's storehouse burns down. And you can also use it to build up supplies and then send them northwards to whoever's army is currently out in the field doing maneuvers. So now we're looking at the Antonine Wall. This is the slightly later wall, and this is built along the thinnest point in the island of Great Britain. And this is more properly a defensive structure. So the Antonine Wall is entirely earthenworks, which is why it looks like the bottom picture now. So the top picture is a reconstruction of what this would have looked like back in the day. Here's what it looks like now. So the earth has fallen into the ditch a bit but you can still see the bones of it. So what this is, if I were, say, a Caledonian, that is a, a tribesman of ancient, what's now Scotland, and I were coming in to raid the Romans, say, I would go over this outer mound and not be able to see down in here at the V-ditch, which is not just a ditch, there are also stakes pointed up at you in this ditch. So you'd go over the mound and then you'd slip down the turf into the ditch. Even if you didn't slip into it though and get impaled on the spikes, you would still have to then go uphill to where Roman soldiers are theoretically here over the wooden fence firing at you. So this is a deterrent wall. This is the first speed bump of defense in order to hold this line in place. And this is part of a larger system of walls all over the empire. So this isn't just happening in the island of Britain. There's also um, a border wall being built along the areas of free Germania. So I'm saying Germania and not Germany because the nation state of Germany is not the same as ancient Germania. Uh, just like Britain, it's a bunch of independent uh, groups 
cooperating, collaborating, and fighting internally with each other, but they do manage to keep Rome mostly out. Sorry, Daisha. And uh, this structure of walls and unified forts with watchtowers that can communicate with each other are part of creating a firm starting and stopping point for the Roman Empire, yes, but also these weren't just about walling off and not communicating in isolationism. In fact, they're quite the opposite. These are places from which Roman diplomats and negotiators and business people can have a safe base of operation from which to move into Germania. The idea that Germania was totally untouched by Roman culture is not accurate. This is a place where trading hubs would be created, alliances would be brokered, where people would collaborate with the Romans in order to solidify their own power base and get nice stuff and create trade contacts, but also they would be trading with the Romans too. This is not just a one-way deal. One of the major things that are often traded across these borders are trafficked human beings. So this is a major entry point for the slave trade, and this becomes increasingly profitable under the Pax Romana because at a certain point Rome stops gobbling up territory. I mean, it's an unsustainable pace that we get in the first centuries BC and CE. You, you just run out of real estate that you can manage at a certain point. So this means that Rome is no longer having regular enough wars to resupply themselves with enslaved people. So they have to get them somewhere and they often get them through illegal piracy and also over these borders. More about that later. This is going to get depressing, sorry. So here is Halton am See, which is a reconstructed Roman fortification wall. So we're going to move a little bit away from walls that are just walls into the forts themselves. Most of these forts were not built out of stone, but were rather built out of timber with turf fillings, sometimes just turf. But often you would face the turf with timber in order to provide structural stability. And here you can see the standardized footprint of a Roman costra. So you can see a series of ditches and wall stakes. So fossa here, you would dig out earth here and you would put the dirt that you excavated here and here, and then you would also dig down to make your wall. And then on the other side of the wall, you would dig a ditch so that anybody crossing the wall is gonna drop down into this ditch and thus have a really hard time attacking you. So this is a series of speed bumps and death traps on your way to the wall itself. The wall which has a series of square crenellations that allow you to put artillery emplacements. So things like your um, lethoboloi and your um, oxybiles, which by this point Romans are calling by different names, but I'm not going to give you more vocabulary at this point. Uh, suffice to say, artillery is getting bigger, more efficient, and able to fire a lot better. So you would be facing down a bunch of um, nasty weapons, watchtowers here and here on either side of the wall. And then here is one of the four gates going into the fortification itself. So here is what it would look like if you were going into a Roman fort, which you would do if you happen to be in an area held by Rome, because these are not just places for your military to hang out. These are places of business, because the military machine of Rome is also big business. They're taking in contracts for things like leather, cloth, food, weapons, repairs, metallurgy, like everything that a Roman army needs to repair their gear and get on with their business, they are going to be sourcing locally. And so local business people are frequently coming and going, and there are purpose-built places inside every Roman camp for that. And they're always in the same place. So no matter where you are in the empire, if you're trying to sell stuff to the Roman army, you know exactly where to go. Convenient. But also these are places where you're going to broker deals. Often you'd have local people going to the Romans to be a third party mediating local disputes, even if you weren't technically in Roman territory. Romans aren't just about the stick. They're also doing a lot of carrot work where they're trying to uh, make diplomatic inroads and thus increase their power. You don't just win wars by beating people up. 
you also create a diplomatic presence. And Romans were very good at that for all. I've been giving them a lot of grief. It's part of how this works. So here is the defensive fortifications from the inside. You see this very broad walkway. Uh, military writers like Vigetius tell us that this has to be wide enough that you can have two carts passing each other. That's important because your artillery are on wheels and you need to be able to move your ballistae and your um, onagers up and down the wall. You also need your troops to be able to pass each other when they're on watch. What else do I want to say about this? Ah, yes, you'll notice that there are two doors in the gateway here. This is so that you can have people coming and going at the same time. Now, this is an efficient way to build a city as well as to build a military encampment. More about that coming up. So I mentioned when we were talking about the gear worn by legionnaires, uh, the sudes, sometimes they're called wali. These are those spikes I was talking about that are used in a modular way to fortify these ditches. So every night when you camped, you would at the very least dig a ditch make a pile so there's a little bit of high ground and then your camp would be inside. And then these modular sudes that you had been carrying around on your furka, on your carrying stick, you would be delegated to take some place in the camp. So you can set them up like a picket fence, which is what we've done here. And these divots in the middle are both so that you can tie them to your carrying stick, your furka, but also you can take a rope and use this to secure the stakes so that they make this nice, very quick picket fence with spikes on the top. So if somebody tries to jump over it, they're gonna get skewered. But you can also cross them over each other, tie them together into this spiky configuration. This you can put on the top of the walls, on the bottom of your ditch, down in your fossa. You can put this around different key places in your fortifications. And if you have a little bit of time before battle, you can also use these as mobile emplacements in order to manipulate the landscape in your favor so that you can have a more successful outcome from whatever it is you're trying to do out there. So these are low-key brilliant, should you find yourself in an apocalypse situation. I highly recommend making some. Use oak. Make sure it's seasoned. See, eh, cedar's a little soft. The pointy bits won't hold. So here's another feature that we start seeing in these Roman camps. Not all of them, but the more long-term settled ones. I mentioned earlier that one of the things you could learn how to do in the Roman legions was be a doctor. Uh, they had both medics, uh, first aid paramedic kind of people, but also full practicing physicians. And at larger forts, they would often have a wallitudinarium, which is Latin for the place of getting better, the hospital. Now, hospitals in the ancient world, we tend to assume that hospital is always a good idea. It is not for reasons that will be pretty obvious when you think about it a hot minute, um, now that we know about germ theory. Yes, when you put a lot of sick people in the same place, sick people get sick people sick. So you end up with a lot of people giving each other diseases, and then you create a perfect petri dish for new diseases. It's not always a good idea. Where a hospital is a good idea is when you're going to have sudden influxes of a lot of hurt and wounded people that you don't necessarily have the resources to treat on site, say you're in a military situation. So by concentrating your most trained physicians in one area and moving your wounded to that area, you can treat them more efficiently and you can provide better health care to your soldiers. And better health care means more survival, which means that you get to keep your veterans longer. So it's a really cost effective thing to do with your military. And it's something that the Roman infrastructure provides for. First, it was kind of an unofficial thing where as an amenity, a general would hire some doctors to be on his staff and then he'd have them treat or train people in the army. Eventually, this became a regular thing as part of Roman law. You could sign up for five years as a doctor with the Roman military. And just in five years, you could end up with citizenship. You could go back to Rome, have a practice. So it was a really good deal if you wanted to go to med school on the cheap. Not that there is ancient med school. That's a whole other thing. It's another class. But at any rate, 
What we've got going on in the Wallitudinarium is also an attempt to counter the downside of putting all your sick people in one place. They did not have germ theory, but they did understand that airflow was really important to reducing the amount of disease that happens in your hospitals. So what they did was the outer layer of the hospital was not roofed and had lots of windows in the side. So you know you're looking at a wallitudinarium when you see, this has been reconstructed, but if you see a lot of windows and not any evidence of roof on the edge, this is both so that if you're operating, you have daylight because without artificial lighting, it's very hard to see what you're operating on. So the operating theaters are open to the sky you can put up an awning to kind of deal with rain, but you're going to need that light in order to operate. And then you have roofed in facilities on the inside layer of the Wallitudinarium here where it's protected, but it's still open with windows and tiers to the air. So there's constant airflow going through. Another innovation are these hallways. So hallways aren't necessarily a thing you see in ancient houses and architecture, but you do see them in a Wallitudinarium. So the patient treatment rooms are these cubicles like here and here. And you see how there's a mini hallway. So you don't walk right into the room from the hallway. Instead, you walk into a subsidiary hallway that then has doors opening to the individual rooms. This breaks up direct airflow from one room to the other. And then fresh air coming into the hallway also creates a pool and a draft, pulling the air up out of the Wallitudinarium and sending fresh air in. So they didn't know exactly why this led to less illness in their hospital facilities, but they knew it worked. And it was pretty darn brilliant. So should you ever need to design a hospital in a low-tech environment, think about this. In fact, this is something that in the age of COVID, we're beginning to do again. Ventilation keeps diseases from spreading through droplets. It's a really important public health measure. We still do this. This is brilliant. Oh, another thing that's brilliant about Roman surgery, and then I will shut up because this is for another class. Most of the instruments they're using to operate with are bronze, where there are steel blades, they're heated up over braziers. Now this isn't done because they know about germ theory again. They're doing it because a hot blade will cauterize as it cuts and it will limit bleeding. But copper alloys have antimicrobial properties. They are um, not quite but almost self-sterilizing. If you let a copper instrument sit for a while, any surface bacteria are going to die naturally, which is why we're going back to using bronze and copper touch plates in hospitals and for surfaces. And it's a kind of antimicrobial action that microbes don't adapt to well, so it doesn't cause resistance. So if your medical instruments are made out of bronze and you're heating up your steel blades over fires, you're not spreading disease by doing surgery. So I'm not saying that Roman healthcare was something we'd consider adequate or amazing by modern standards, but it is pretty darn effective to the point where we don't see systems with as efficient frontline military healthcare until we get into like World War I, even World War II is a bit better as a comparandum. But really, World War One is, it's a little bit better. At least by then they have germ theory and they start doing this ventilation thing again because they know about germs. So yay, gold star Roman hospitals. Here's the footprint of another Wallitudinarium. Um, this is that same reconstruction we were just looking at. And you can see from the footprint here, you've got these long hallways and then you've got these sub hallways with split rooms. So whenever you're looking at a Roman castra, even if you're looking at the foundations, you can spot the Wallitudinarium by looking for this kind of a structure. Not this literal structure, there's some variations, but it's enough that I've been able to clock them on the ground and then I'll look at the map and be like, oh, yay, I found the Wallitudinarium. So this is a game you can play with yourself if you're ever out in Europe looking at Roman forts. Next, we're gonna to move to a specific fort. This is the Fort of Vindolanda along Hadrian's Wall. 
And it's a great place to look at because it's on boggy soil that preserves cloth and leather really well, and also wood. So we have so much evidence from this fort that we don't normally have preserved. And this means we can talk about the daily life of soldiers stations on Hadrian's Wall. So quick overview of who these soldiers are, where they're from. Romans believed that the climate you grow up in has an effect on your battle readiness. They believe that if you're from a hot area, that you are smarter, but also less willing to take risks. So if you were from a hot area, they'd often send you to a cold area because they thought that the cold would make you braver by kind of thickening your blood. Also for practical reasons, they take you as far away from your home as possible so your loyalty would be to Rome. So the people who are stationed in Vindolanda specifically and Hadrian's Wall in general are from places like the Near East, North Africa, Egypt, Syria. Um, the cavalry are taken from the Danube River Valley, so Eastern Europe, um, modern Romania. So these are people from the literal other end of the empire up on Hadrian's Wall. Recruits from Britain would have been sent to North Africa, the Near East. So you would have gotten shuffled around the board. Uh, they also believed that cold, cold climates, if you grow up in a cold climate, you're gonna be really brave, but really stupid because your cold, phlegmy brain just wouldn't be able to process risk very well. So they thought <laughs> you had to uh, send cold people down south to kind of calm them down a little bit ancient racism guys it's still racism just different rules so the people along hadrian's wall uh, imagine them a little browner than you generally think of people in europe this is true for roman britain in general too um, roman british bodies on analysis show signs of descent from north africa ancient near east egypt um, eastern europe So just to remind you, Castra is the name for a Roman military camp, and here's another outline of a Castra, so just situate yourself. Vindolanda is a Castra, so let's look at Vindolanda itself. Here it is. So you can spot the Castra immediately, right? Look for the rounded cornered square thing with the four doors on it. Boom, there it is. Um, it's also labeled. And you can see that this is a a pretty nice fort. There are nicer, more fortified forts, but this has a stone foundation for its walls. At the middle, these buildings, those are the officers' quarters and general offices. So this is where you would go to talk to command, and this is where you'd live if you were the fancy officers. They have underfloor heating, they're all very nice, they have like bath facilities. It's Nice, very nice. There are some stone foundations for other parts of the fort, including this over here is probably um, a granary area and other kinds of water storage. So you want to keep food and water inside the fort. There would have been wooden or perhaps earthenwork structures elsewhere, but you'll notice it's not just the fort that's part of the archeological site. This here is the town or the Wicus, and this is pretty normal for a Roman fort. You'll have the fort, and then outside you'll have places where local people settle in order to take advantage of the business coming from the Roman fort, because the Roman fort is a giant bachelor pad city where people want to have nice places to go when they have time off, or there's a lot of business to be had by selling stuff to the Romans, and people take advantage of that business. This includes bar facilities, um, places where sex workers live, um, restaurants, gambling areas, recreational areas, sports places, little amenities. And this would have been inhabited by local folks, by Britons. So the Romans 
are really close with their British neighbors, and these are people who see each other daily. This is not to say it's not tense, because it's super tense, and there's a lot of violence breaking out in this situation, but there's also a lot of day-to-day -day collaboration. And you also have all of these young people far away from home, many of them are in the process of having their names changed into a more Roman acceptable version of their native name as part of their Romanization procedure. So on both sides of this wall, you have people who are colonized being processed into a Roman mold, losing and modifying their culture to cope with the situation in which they find themselves. So here are the underfloor heating structures I was talking about, the hypocausts. Uh, this is a way of heating houses without having a fire inside the house directly. You have a furnace on the edge of the house, and then there's kind of like an underfloor chimney that pulls hot air through the floors and up through the walls, thus keeping the area warm. But again, this is just for the business offices and the places where the fancy officers live. Not everybody gets this. Here are tabulae. So this is how Roman people did records keeping. So the scratch paper isn't a thing in the ancient world, by and large. Paper is valuable. You use it for permanent books. You don't use it to keep your ledgers on. Instead, you use pieces of wood, often covered with wax, and then you would scratch letters into the wax. And this was important not just for sustainability reasons, right? The, the wood was cheap, the wax was cheap, but also if you erased some of the writing on the wax, it would show. So it was tamper-proof technology, and you could tie string around it and then seal it with wax, and that would keep people from messing with your records. So this is secured documents. This is password protection for the Roman world. What you would do to seal it if you were the officer in charge of this record is you'd take your signet ring and you'd smush it into hot wax. This would create an impression that only your ring would fit. So even if someone tried to make a copy, their ring wouldn't exactly fit because these aren't mass-produced rings in the way we mass-produce rings. And at Vindolanda, we have so many of these because the wood is well preserved. And they're using sheets of beech wood, which is a super easy to get inexpensive wood that you can get locally. And they're writing directly on the wood, which means that these records are preserved really well. And this has things like inventory and requisition. So people making a list of what kind of gear they have on hand, who they're ordering their stuff from, and also letters. We have party invitations for one of the general's wives who's writing to the other general's wives down the wall. And she's like, hey, it's Scintilla's birthday party next week. Let's all get together on Friday and have a party. So although it's mostly dudes fighting in the Roman army, the officers are allowed to marry and they frequently bring their families. So there are women in these camps and not just as wives. Um, sometimes if the general was out of town, his wife would do the commanding for the day. In some cases, women were actually in command. Fulvia, for instance, commanded the siege of Paestum. So uh, there's that. More about that in a minute. We also have some letters preserved on these wood tablets, and it's one of my favorites is a soldier writing home, and he's like, oh my god, send socks, please send socks, I'm so cold, so cold. And imagine this dude from Syria in the middle of a British winter who's like, socks please, which kind of gives you an idea of the physical conditions too for average soldiers in your not under floor heated tent or at best a, a little building watching the walls day after day. So there's incredible amounts of boredom and homesickness and scrambling for supplies because although there is a supply infrastructure, soldiers do seem to have some difficulty getting a hold of their own stuff. And, you know, it's nice to be warm. So here is just a small, small sampling of stuff we found at Vindolanda, including this is a dice shaker with a couple of D6s. You'll notice that a Roman D6 looks exactly like a modern D6, down to the way the dots are arranged on the side. That's true for 
most of the periods we've been looking at. The six-sided dice thing was an important part of gambling, and this is what you would do to satiate your boredom. And part of what Tacitus is talking about when he talks about discipline is cracking down on people gambling while they're on watch or on duty, because if you're just sitting freezing your butt off on one of these walls looking down at this village where like nothing is happening, nobody's invading, like it's days and days of boredom and occasionally Boudicca burns down Colchester. So you have people waiting in tense situations, getting super duper duper bored. So in order to while away the time, they'd play dice on duty or get drunk or you know, do all of the things that you do to not lose your mind from boredom. But this meant that your watch might not be the most alert. So discipline meant cutting down on these things that were keeping people from losing their mind a little bit. So if you were a soldier and a new general comes in and he's like confiscating your dice and taking away your cards and not making sure that your butt wasn't freezing off, you might have a very different idea about how much you love this new discipline than does Tacitus. A couple other things here. Many, many, many hair combs. These are important because it's used for pest control. In order to get rid of head lice in a pre-modern context, you would put oil in your hair and then you would use these fine-toothed combs to comb out the, the eggs, the nits, and the, the baby lice from your hair. And this was a constant job, but very important because lice spread disease. In point of fact, typhus, also called camp fever, which can take out an entire unit. Military doctors most of the time wouldn't be treating war wounds. They'd be treating things like typhus, malnutrition, exposure, exposure, frostbite, chill banes, all this wear and tear stuff that comes from living in sketchy conditions under a lot of stress without adequate nutrition in close quarters, right? It's eight dudes in a tiny tent freezing their butts off in the middle of a British winter. And these combs are all that's standing between them and a lice infection. So also though, we have this vanity oil lamps. So this is what your lighting looks like. The missing big toe is where you'd put the wick. So you'd fill this up with olive oil and you'd light a wick. You'd pour the olive oil in here and you'd put it on the lamp stand, right? You put the foot on the stand, get it? It's a pun in Latin too. It's really cute. So it's a foot lamp. I love this guy. That's adorable. Uh, most lamps are a bit more basic, but this gives you an idea of the kind of stuff that Roman soldiers are buying to dress up their tents. They're buying these cute novelty lamps and you know fancy combs and pretty dice sets in order to make their lives a little bit nicer. But this is the kind of thing that a new general might crack down on. Like, why are you spending your pay on this fancy lamp? This lamp isn't regulation. What are you doing with it? That kind of conversation. Also over here, we have evidence of one of my favorite things to come out of Roman uh, military encampments, and that's a poppy print. So this is on a tile that would have been part of a um, fancy floor. And this paw print is big. It's the size of my hand, giant paw print. So let's meet the puppy that made the print. There he is, look at him. This is a Canis molossus. We still use the word molosser to talk about this genre of breeds descending from Roman war dogs. So these were extra big mastiffs that looked kind of like lions. They had these big kind of mane things going around around their neck and big brawny bulky shoulders and chompy chompy jaws um and they're used for well similar things to what uh, police and military dogs are used for today they would go bite people hold them down they would watch the perimeter they'd bork 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 if somebody was coming up to the gate you know they, they did dog stuff Dogs are still used in the military for exactly the same reasons that Romans used their dogs. Um, maybe not so much with the sniffing thing, but they did know about sniffy dogs. So here's another sculpture. This this good boy is from Pompeii. Look at him, isn't he a good boy? And kind of gives you an idea of what this breed looks like. So you have the kind of fuzzy around the neck, but big, chonky, and the big jowls. So this is the ancestor of the Neapolitan Mastiff, also the Great Dane, and the German Shepherd, probably. So a lot of these big dog breeds coming out of this area are related to this kind of breed. Now, the Romans themselves bred them specifically to be big, honky, brawny puppies. And 
they might have sourced them partly from the Canary Islands. Uh, the, uh, what is it, um, Presario Canario is still a, a modern breed that's descended from the ancient breed. King Juba of Mauritania had a pair of them that were his special puppies. Fun fact, Juba of Mauritania is so cool. Very nerdy. Love that guy. At any rate. The closest modern descendant is probably the Khorasani dog, or the Aryan Molossus. Um, not that kind of Aryan, not the gross kind. Uh, this is a chunky, sort of German Shepherd-adjacent breed with a big, fluffy ruff. So that fluffy, floppy ruff is a security feature, because if somebody else's dog bites them on the ruff, it's not going to be a death injury. It makes it harder to bite the dog around the throat, so it's good for safety. And they're just very good boys. Uh, for those of you who don't know Latin, they're saying, we're good boys, because they're good boys. They're good boys. They're good. I, I mean, you shouldn't attack people with your dogs in the pursuit of empire, but puppies. Puppies. So I mentioned that women and children are part of the mix in these garrisons, and here is uh, some smoking gun evidence in case you wanted some. This is from Trajan's column commemorating the campaigns in Dacia, modern day Romania-ish. And this is showing the wives and the children, probably of the officers, but not necessarily. Some soldiers had unofficial wives and families who would come with them. Also, some women were contracted out to do work for the Roman military because women were business people and craftspeople and cooks and uh, all, all kinds of businesses. If a woman ran the business and she offered the local Roman unit the best rates, then they would hire her to do the thing. Uh, Roman law recognized women business owners. Roman business owners had the same kind of protections and um, for the most part, respect as did their male counterparts. And by the Roman Empire, they also had ways to have their own legal personhood and independence too, without getting into a bunch of details here. Regularly, uh, as I said, generals, wives, and families would come with them. In fact, the emperor Gaius got his nickname Caligula because when he was a little baby, he lived with his dad and his mom commanding the legions of the Rhine, and they gave him a little soldier's uniform with a tiny little Lorca segmentata and little army boots, little Kale guy. So his nickname Caligula means little bootykins. He hated it when people used that nickname, by the way. So if you want to make Emperor Gaius really mad, call him Caligula. He was kind of awful, but he was a really cute little baby. Now, it's not just Roman women coming along for the ride, too. Remember the Wicus? There were women living there, and some of them would get involved in long-term relationships with the soldiers. When the soldier retired and stayed in the area, he'd be allowed to officially recognize that marriage, and the children would be made retroactively legal, and therefore Roman citizens themselves. So although there was a lot of sexual violence and horribleness going on between Roman legionaries and locals, not all of it was necessarily violent and toxic. The soldiers also were victims of empire, and they were making the best out of their really difficult living situation and a culture of violence. And a lot of them in that situation chose to make a family, uh, presumably with a level of consent, at least I would like to hope that most women could run off in that situation, which a lot of them did, like we have some evidence of that happening in ancient Rome. So let's go with that to be a little bit less depressing. But not just women, but also like little kids and not just the officers kids either. We find a lot of little kids shoes in the mud at Vindolanda because babies lose their shoes. This here in the corner is one of my favorite finds from Vindolanda. So this is a tiny Roman era sock. Uh, you can see that knitting hasn't been invented yet. It's woven and this would be tucked into your, your little sandal boot or sometimes you'd have a closed toe boot. But the thing that makes this super adorable it's a baby sock. I've seen this in person. It, it's tiny. It's like the, the size of my son's foot, tiny, bitty, bitty. So like 
little toddlers were tootling around and this was found inside the castra. So little kids are running around underfoot in the middle of this camp. Now they weren't supposed to be there. Uh, the officers' families, yeah, okay, officers could do that, but legionaries' families weren't supposed to exist. Like you were supposed to wait until you retired to have that family. Uh, not until the time of Hadrian were soldiers finally allowed to marry while they were serving. And this is something that soldiers got through collective bargaining and threatened walkouts. So go them. Yay, Hadrian, sort of. Hadrian, oh, Hadrian, so problematic. Okay. So one of the things that would have been cracked down on when Agricola runs in and is like disciplined commander is he would have been cracking down on having families. So he would have been kicking people's kids out of the castra and he would have been separating families so that the soldiers could go marching into Scotland. And this would have meant that families would have been left suddenly without soldiers they'd gotten used to living with. Um, fending without that local business, although the soldiers did come back very quickly, so it's not too horrible, but the anxiety in the minute would have been considerable. So when we're talking about discipline, we're talking about enforcing an anti-family policy that harmed and caused distress to Roman soldiers, so much distress that it's one of their number one items that they lobby the emperor to get. And that's important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, I've given the Roman soldiers a lot of well-deserved static for what they're doing in Britain, but they're human beings who just wanted to have some kind of a life while they were still young enough to enjoy it. And gosh darn it, I am supportive of that because your family, your family is important, but when you're going into combat scenarios, you really need your family and that support is a lifeline that holds you to your sanity and um, helps you keep contact with your more ethical, better nature and causing people to repeatedly have to give up their family that they've made for themselves in the field miles and miles away from their homeland cannot help but create a recipe for upset soldiers who then take out their violence on the closest target, namely the province they're administering. So I, I get why this happens. I'm blaming the emperor and the soldiers could have done better, but there are reasons. So next up, if, in case you were wondering where Romans poop, we know that in Vindolanda too. So they had common latrines. I mentioned that Romans knew not to drink where they poop. It's important. And one of the first things you do when you made Roman camp every single night, even when you're out marching, is you dig a pit and you make a latrine. Now, Roman latrines in permanent settlements look like this. This is a really nice one. This is the toilet seat from Vindolanda. It's cut out of a piece of wood. It's got a little narrow place for you to do your business in. You know, it's going to look really familiar to you. So this would have been over an open pit, uh, smelly, chilly. Your, your butt would have been quite cold. This would have been damp and nasty and kind of hard to clean. So this isn't the gold standard for hygiene, but by ancient standards, this is great. So that's the good news. Yay, you're not drinking water contaminated with poop most of the time. So next up, we need to talk about the cult of Mithras. And uh, I'm going to treat this briefly, both because there's only so much time, but also we don't know a ton about this cult. So this was a cult that seems to have been invented by Roman legionaries serving along the Parthian border. And it's kind of a Roman hot take on maybe Zoroastrianism, sort of, kind of. So what seems to have happened is that these Roman legionaries wanted to come up with a special religion that they could share in as a community and take with them wherever they went. The cult of Mithras is based around this Persian, only it's not really a Persian god, but it's this Roman idea of a Persian god, Mithras, who at some 
point killed a bull in a cave. We're not sure why, because it was a secret religion and we don't have a lot of instructions or information, but it was really big in the Roman legions. It was a men only membership cult, which is partly why it didn't do too well long term. But while the Roman legion as a culture and as an extended family existed, and while the Romans were still sending people around from base to base to base, this created a community away from home and a way to share religion structures that weren't necessarily controlled by the state. So yeah, you're still worshiping the eagle. You can worship the eagle and Mithras. But Mithras was something just for you and your community. You would worship him in these caves. We'll be looking at a Mithraeum later. There's some kind of sacrifice and communal feasting going on. We even have surviving a fragmentary order of service in a Mithraic celebration, but it doesn't tell us as much as you think it might. It's about as informative as if we had like, um, oh, a Christian boilerplate mass and knew nothing about Christianity it would be like, father, son, what? So that's the situation with Mithras, but we do have a lot of art in these places where he's worshiped, including this altar to Mithras at Vindolanda. So he was worshipped everywhere there are Roman soldiers. Here is a Mithraeum, one of several. This one's in Italy, but there are a couple in Britain, including one in London that I've been to. Nice. So these were made to be caves because of this killing a bull in a cave thing. The hat that Mithras wears, this kind of slumpy hat thing, was typical of people living in Asia Minor on the border with Parthia. Uh, you'll sometimes hear it called a Phrygian cap. And it was also worn by Romans when they were newly liberated from enslavement. That's uh, sometimes called a freedman's hat or a pileus. And he's wearing like trousers with a tunic, that's stereotypical Persian dress. So it's a little bit of an imperialism move here. They can't conquer Persia, but they're like, hey, we're serving on the Persian border, so we're gonna take your god. And the Persians are like, who? <laughs> yeah, that's not the point quite. Um, let's see, I think that's everything I have to say about Mithras for the time being. The membership was huge back in the day. This was at one point a real contender with Christianity for a major new religion coming out of the Roman world. But not allowing women to join is a kind of unsustainable way to build your religious tradition. Just saying.